Live from St. Anselm College in New Hampshire, here again are David Muir and Bartha Reds. Welcome back to New Hampshire. ABC News coverage of the Republican debate, and it's great to have you back at the podiums, and we want to turn to race in America and Mr. Trump. There are many who argue cell phones and smartphones are just now exposing uh, what's been happening in this country for years, cases of excessive force against minorities. As you know, Mr. Trump, on the other side, the FBI director recently said there's a chill wind blowing through law enforcement because of increased scrutiny. You have said police are the most mistreated people in America. As president, how do you bridge the divide? Well, there is a divide, but I have to say that the police are absolutely mistreated and misunderstood. And if there is an incident, whether it's an uh, incident done purposely, which is a horror, and you should really take very strong action, or if it's a mistake, it's on your newscasts all night, all week, all month, and it never ends. The police in this country have done an unbelievable job of keeping law and order. And they're afraid for their jobs. They're afraid of the mistreatment they get. And I'm telling you that not only me speaking, minorities all over the country, they respect the police of this country. And we have to give them more respect. They can't act. They can't act. They're afraid for losing their pension, their job. They don't know what to do. And I deal with them all the time. We have to give great respect, far greater than we are right now, to our really fantastic police. Great. Mr. Trump. I did ask about bridging the divide, though, as president. So what would you say to the American families who say, we have lived through this, we have seen excessive force? What would you say to those Well, countries? they do, and, you know, they sue. Everybody sues, right? They see excessive... I mean, they go out, they sue. We have so much litigation. I see the courts, I see what they're doing. They sue, and you know what? We don't want excessive force. But at what point? You know, either you're going to have a police force that can do its job. I was just up in Manchester. I met with the police officers yesterday. Tremendous people. They love the area. They love the people. They love all the people. They want to do their job. And you're going to have abuse, and you're going to have problems, and you've got to solve the problems, and you have to weed out the problems. But the police in this country are absolutely amazing people. Mr. David, Trump, thank David, you. David. I do David. want to ask... Uh, uh, I, want, I wanted to say, look, this, this can be a win-win here. Uh, I, I have formed a collaborative between police and community leaders because people have to respect law enforcement. A family doesn't want dad or mom going home in a box. And for our community leaders, many of them think the system not only works, uh, not, not only doesn't work for them, but it works against them. And I created a big collaborative in Ohio made up of law enforcement, community leaders, the head of my public safety, and a former Democrat, liberal, State Senator Nina Turner run it. They got together, they made recommendations on recruiting, on hiring, on the use of deadly force, and what we're about to do is to bring community and police together so we can have a win-win. We need more win-wins in America, and we don't have to pick one over another or divide. We love the police, but we've got to be responsive to the people in the communities. Governor, we have to do you. all of it. Yeah, Senator Rubio, I want to ask you next. President Obama visited a mosque this week in America for the first time in his presidency. President George W. Bush visited a mosque after September 11th. You said of President Obama, quote, he's always pitting people against each other. So I'm curious, how are the two visits different, and would you visit a mosque as president? I would, but that's not the, the issue. My problem with what he did is he continues to put out this fiction that there's widespread, systematic discrimination against Muslim Americans. First of all, let's recognize this. If you go to a national cemetery in this country, you will see stars of David's and crosses, but you'll also see crescent moons. There are brave men and women who happen to be Muslim Americans who are serving this country in uniform and who have died in the service of this country. And we recognize that and we honor that. But by the same token, we face a very significant threat of homegrown violent extremism. We need to have strong, positive relationships in the Islamic communities in this country so they will identify and report this activity, especially mosques, for example, that are participating not just in hate speech, but in inciting violence and in taking acts against us. And I do believe it is important also to recognize, you want to talk about religious discrimination in America? Well, I don't think Barack Obama is being, so, is being sued by any Islamic groups, but he is being sued by the Little Sisters of the Poor. We are facing in this country Christian groups and groups that hold traditional values who feel and in fact are being discriminated against by the laws of this country that try to force them to violate their conscience. Senator Rubio, thank you. Martha. 
Governor Christie, earlier this week, the World Health Organization declared the Zika virus a global emergency. The same kind of mosquitoes that carry the Zika virus in Latin America are found here in the United States, and the virus has been linked to severe birth defects. Governor Christie, at the peak of the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, you ordered an American nurse who landed at Newark Airport be detained and quarantined. As fear spread now of the Zika virus, and with the Rio Olympics just months away, is there a scenario where you would quarantine people traveling back from Brazil to prevent the spread in the United States? You bet I would. And the fact is that because I took strong action to make sure that anyone who was showing symptoms, let me remember what happened with that nurse. She was showing symptoms and coming back from a place that had the Ebola virus active, and she had been treating patients. This was not just some like we picked her up if, just for the heck of it, right? We did it because she was showing symptoms. And the fact is, that's the way you should make these decisions. You make these decisions based upon the symptoms, the medicine, and the law. We quarantined her. She turned out to test negative, ultimately, after 48 hours, and we released her back to the state of Maine. But I want to add something on, on, on the issue of mosques. Now, I'm the only one up here who's got a law enforcement background and was the U.S. attorney after September 11th. I went to mosques throughout my state to build bridges, to build bridges between our community and law enforcement so we could get intelligence and information from these folks. I've had the experience of working with them as governor of New Jersey as well. We cannot mix the radical Islamic jihadists with everyday Muslim Americans. New Jersey has the second largest Muslim American population in America of any state. These are good, law-abiding, hard-working people. What they need is our cooperation and our understanding they do not need just broadsides against them because of the religious faith they practice. Governor Christie, thank you. I'm going to move to Dr. Carson and go back to the Zika virus. Is that going too far, quarantining? You're a doctor. What would you do? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's not a simple issue. And now, you know, we've got evidence that there can be active viruses in other bodily fluids like saliva and urine. So this is going to be obviously a big deal. Uh, do we quarantine people if we have evidence that they are infected and that there is evidence that that infection can spread by something that they're doing? Yes. But, uh, you know, just willy-nilly going out and quarantining a bunch of people because they've been to Brazil, uh, I don't believe that that's going to work. What we really need to be thinking about is how do we get this disease under control? And this is, this is where we need rapid response. We need a rapid response for Ebola. We need rapid response for Zika. There will be other things that will come up. And uh, these are the kinds of things that the NIH, the CDC, can uh, be very effective in. We need to give them the appropriate support for those kinds of things. Thanks very much, Dr. Carson. I want to move on to the military. Senator Rubio, all restrictions on women in combat have been lifted as long as they qualify, positions including special operations forces like Navy SEALs. Just this week, the military leaders of the Army and Marine Corps said that they believe young women, just as young men are required to do, should sign up for selective service in case the draft is reinstated. Many of you have young daughters. Senator Rubio, should young women be required to sign up for selective service in case of a national emergency? Well, first let me say there are already women today serving in roles that are like combat, that in fact whose lives are in very serious danger. And so I'm, I have no problem whatsoever with people of either gender serving in combat, so long as the minimum requirements necessary to do the job are not compromised. But I support that. And obviously, if now, now that that is the case, I do believe that selective service should be opened up for both men and women in case a draft is ever instituted. I think the more fundamental challenge we're now facing is what's happening to the U.S. military. I've said this many times already, and I think it's important to start paying attention to this. Our Air Force is about to be the smallest it's been in 100 years. I'm sorry, in our history. Our Army is set to be smaller than it's been since the Second World War. And our Navy is about to be the smallest than it's been in 100 years. I think we need to begin to refocus on rebuilding our military, because every time we have cut our military in the history of this country, we have had to come back later and rebuild it, and it costs more, and it's a lot more chaotic and dangerous. When I'm president, we are rebuilding the U.S. military. Thank you, Senator Rubio. Governor Bush, do you believe that young women... Say it again. Do you believe young women should sign up for selective service, be required I, I to do, do so? I do, I do. And I think that we should not impose any kind of uh, political agenda on the military. There should be 
if women can can um, re meet the requirements, the minimum requirements for combat service, they ought to have the right to do it for sure. Uh, it ought to be focused on the morale as well. We ought to make sure that we have readiness uh, much higher than we do today. We need to eliminate the sequester, which is devastating our military. We can't be focusing on the political side of this. We need to realize that our military force is how we project our word in the world. When we are weak militarily, it doesn't matter what we say. We can talk about red lines and ISIS being the JV team and reset buttons and all this. If we don't have a strong military, then no one fears us and they take actions that are against our national interests. Tell me what you'd say to American people out there who are sitting at home, who have daughters, yeah. who might worry about those answers and might why, worry why, why that the worry draft is reinstituted. Well, the draft's not going to be reinstituted, but why if, if, if women are, are but accessing... But you do away with it? No, I didn't say that. You, you, you asked the question not about the draft. You asked about registering. And if women are going you to be supporting... register the draft. If, but if we don't have a draft. I'm not suggesting we have a draft. What I'm suggesting is that we ought to have readiness being the first priority of our military, and secondly, that we make sure that the morale is high. And right now, neither one of those are acceptable because we've been gutting the military budget. We also need to reform our procurement process. We need to make sure that there are more men and women in uniform than people, than civilians in our defense department. There's a lot of things that we need to do to reform to bring our defense uh, capabilities into the 21st century, and I'm the guy that could do that. That's why I have the support of generals, of admirals, of 12 uh, Medal of Honor recipients, and many other people that know that I would be a steady commander-in-chief and rebuild our military. Martha. Martha. Thank you very much. Can I, can I be really... I'm going to be really clear on this because I am the father of two daughters. Uh, one of them's here tonight. Um, what my wife and I have taught our daughters right from the beginning, that their sense of self-worth, their sense of value, their sense of what they want to do with their life comes not from the outside but comes from within. And if a young woman in this country wants to go and fight to defend her country, she'd be permitted to do so. And part of that also needs to be a part of a greater effort in this country. And so there's no reason why one young woman should be discriminated against from registering for the selective service. The fact is we need to be a party and a people that makes sure that our women in this country understand anything they can dream, anything that they want to aspire to, they can do. That's the way we raise our daughters, and that's what we should aspire to as president for all the women in our country. Thank you very much, Governor Christie. Can I say we something? We just covered, uh, wait one second, Dr. Something Carson. Something about the draft, just very quickly. Very quickly. Um, you know, 14% decrease in the number of people applying for voluntary military service, and I think part of it is because of the way that we treat our veterans. You know, we wouldn't be a free country if it wasn't for them. And we have 22 veterans per day committing suicide. So I think what we should do is have an external support system for people once they volunteer. And it should follow them throughout their career. Uh, they should follow them for three years or five years afterwards. A year before they get out, it should be working on integrating them back into society so that uh, they quit on Friday and they start their new job. They should have health empowerment accounts that are subsidized so they can go to any medical facility and be taken care of. They can go to a VA if they want to. But if we start taking care of our veterans the right way, we won't have to ever worry about a draft again. Thank you very much for bringing up that subject, Dr. Carson, of our veterans. And for another question about our veterans, we go back to Josh McKelvin from WMUR. Josh. Thank you, Martha. None of you on stage tonight have ever worn a uniform as a member of the armed service. That's the reality of it. But uh, as a commander in chief, you'll also be charged with the care of 23 million active duty service <coughs> members and veterans in this country. Some have suggested privatizing the VA as a way to enhance care and increase the quality of the care. Uh, and access. Others say that uh, veterans should carry ID cards that would allow them access to any hospital or health care provider. Governor Bush, what specifically would you do to ensure that those who have sacrificed for us are cared for? I totally agree that we need to give veterans more choices. A veteran's card to be able to go to a private provider will enhance the quality of the service inside the Department of Veterans Affairs. We need career civil service reform. Only three people were fired after waiting lists were dropped where veterans didn't get care, and people died. It is outrageous. And Hillary Clinton says that that's acceptable because she is captive of the public service unions. Career civil service reform would allow the next president to fire people that are, sheer, that are just showing sheer incompetence. At a town hall meeting today, 
Someone came, told the story of their father, who looked like he was 85. He, had, he got a bill eight years later from an operation he had, eight years it took. They couldn't resolve the dispute. And then he was told that he died. Literally, the Veterans Administration sent a death certificate to this guy. And uh, it took nine months to clarify the guy. I met him, and he's voting for me, and he is <laughs> likely to be alive. This is, this is outrageous. It is completely outrageous. So giving veterans more choices, creating centers of excellence, focusing on the true problems that exist. Dr. Carson is completely right. We need to start focusing on this earlier before they become veterans so that there's a customized plan so people don't fall through the cracks. We can do this, but it's going to require someone who has proven leadership skills to make it happen. Josh, Governor, Josh, Governor Josh. Kasich, do you have a favorite approach? Josh, I mean, clearly, when a veteran comes home, they should get health care anywhere they want to go. In our state, which is what we should do in the country, you know, if they drive a truck from Kabul to Kandahar in Afghanistan, we say you can dr drive a truck from Columbus to Cleveland and we don't have to go get a license. We're going to hand you one. And if you've got expertise in the military, we're going to give you college credit or community uh, college credit for the things that you did for our country. And in addition to that, I'll tell you one of the biggest things I think has to be done, and I would do it as president, the Pentagon has got to work with the returning soldier, sailor, along with the family, and we have, they're the most valuable employees in the country. I call them golden employees. Everybody wants to hire a veteran, but there is a disconnect between the job openings and the veteran when the veteran comes back. The veteran is a leader. The veteran is strong. The veteran is drug-free. There should be no unemployment among veterans, and if the Pentagon will work with the veteran services agencies all across this country, Josh, we can get people jobs, and we can get them jobs quickly, get them their health care, get them their college education. Let's lift them. They're the greatest people defending the United States of America, and we need to take care of them, and we will. We uh, will. Uh, Senator Rubio, okay. yeah. Well, my brother's a veteran. We're very proud of him in our family. He served as a Green Beret in the 7th Special Forces from 1968 through 1971. And as part of his training, he jumped out of an airplane and he lost his two front teeth. And for years, he's had to go to get these dental claims. And every time he goes to get one of these dental claims filled, the VA asks him, well, how do we know you lost your teeth in the Army? And he says, well, it's the only time I ever jumped out of a plane. But he's had to fight through this process, and I've watched it firsthand. That's why I'm proud that I worked in a bipartisan way. We passed the VA accountability bill that, for the first time, allows us to fire, allows the VA secretary to fire someone who's not doing a good job, who's a senior executive. And the governor's right. They've only fired the three people up to now. More people will be fired if I'm president. But the portability part of it is incredibly important. Veterans should be able to take their VA benefits to any hospital or any doctor they want to go to. When I am president of the United States, veterans will be able to take their benefits to any hospital or any doctor that they choose. Senator Rubio, thanks very much. We've got to move forward now. David, Martha, back to you. Josh, thank you. I want to turn to a family that New Hampshire voters know quite well. And Senator Cruz, the issue of hostages has been a very real and painful one here in this state. As we all know, James Foley was killed. His mother, Diana, said our government should be willing to negotiate, arguing that families should also be allowed to raise money for ransom. What would you say to Diane Foley tonight? Should families be allowed to raise money for ransom for their loved ones? Well, look, I recognize it is an agonizing experience. Uh, when anyone is facing a loved, loved member who's been kidnapped. Uh, but at the same time, putting in place legal regimes that encourage the payment of ransom has the effect of putting a bounty on other Americans. There is a reason it has been longstanding U.S. policy that we don't negotiate with terrorists, we don't pay ransoms. If you look at what President Obama has done over and over again, whether it was the James Bergdahl deal, which was absolutely shameful, releasing five senior Taliban terrorists to bring Bergdahl back, or whether it was this recent deal with Iran, where again, up to 21 terrorists or potential terrorists were, were released or not prosecuted in order to bring back four Americans. What that do does is it effectively puts a bounty on American servicemen and women serving abroad, on American tourists traveling abroad. And the proper approach is a president and commander-in-chief that defends this country and that goes after, goes after the terrorists 
rather than showing them weakness and encouraging them to target more Americans. Senator Cruz, thank you. Mr. Trump, what would you say to Diane Foley? Should families be allowed to raise money for ransom? Well, I, I know Diane Foley very well. Uh, her husband, and uh, these are tremendous people. Uh, I spoke for them. Uh, I've raised a lot of money for the foundation. I fully understand uh, James, one of the, that was really the first that we saw really visually so, so horrible. Uh, and I will tell you, though, with all of that being said, you cannot negotiate this way with terrorists. If you do, you're going to have many, many more James Foley's. Uh, James Foley was a great young man. His parents are incredible people. They've done such a good job since his, since his death. But you just cannot negotiate that way with terrorists, or you're going to have so many other James Foley's. And just one thing on the vets. Uh, during the last debate, I raised $6 million for the vets. And I will tell you something. I will tell you that I think nobody here, nobody on this stage, gets along with the veterans groups in New Hampshire better than I do, with Al Baldessaro and all of the people that I deal with. And these are great people. Uh, the one thing that we're not mentioning, there's tremendous fraud, waste, and abuse in the Veterans Administration. And if I'm running things, that's going to disappear, and it's going to disappear quickly. Mr. Trump, thank you. We want to turn now to social issues and young voters, and for the question from Mary Catherine. Thanks, David. Senator Rubio, one of the lazier pieces of political conventional wisdom is that so-called social issues are hurting Republicans with young people. But on the two most prominent social issues, polling with millennials actually moves in different directions. On one hand, it's clear young people across the political spectrum increasingly favor same-sex marriage. However, young voters have not moved to the left on abortion. In fact, large numbers of them favor at least some modest restrictions that conservatives have supported. How do you speak to millennials on both these issues while Democrats will inevitably charge intolerance and extremism? Well, first of all, I don't believe that, that believing in traditional marriage the way I do makes you a bigot or a hater. It means that you believe that this institution that's been around for <coughs> millennia is an important cornerstone of our society. I respect people that believe differently, but I believe deeply that marriage should be between one man and one woman. On the issue of life... To me, the issue of life is not a political issue. It's a human rights issue, and it's a difficult issue because it puts in conflict two competing rights. On the one hand is the right of a woman to choose what to do with her body, which is a real right. And on the other hand is the right of an unborn human child to live. And they're in conflict, and as a policymaker, I must choose which one of these two sides takes precedence. And I've chosen to err on the side of life. Here's what I find outrageous. There has been five Democratic debates the media has not asked them a single question on abortion. And on abortion, the Democrats are extremists. Why doesn't the media ask Hillary Clinton why she believes that all abortion should be legal, even on the due date of that unborn child? Why don't they ask Hillary Clinton why she believes that partial birth abortion, which is a gruesome procedure that has been outlawed in this country, she thinks that's a fundamental right. They are the extremists when it comes to the issue of abortion, and I can't wait to expose them in a general election. Governor Bush, I want to come to you. Your allies have recently attacked Senator Rubio for being too pro-life to be elected in November. You've made a similar charge today in an, in an interview. Uh, this is a pro-life party. Do you stand behind that criticism? Look, I'm, I'm pro-life. In fact, on this stage, I'm the most pro-life person because I've acted on it for eight years as governor of the state of Florida, where we abolished <laughs> partial birth abortion, where parents have the right to be notified when they're when their teenage child is having an abortion. We were the first state to do a Choose Life license plate to raise money for adoption. We were the first state to have state monies go to crisis pregnancy centers, which recently was just increased to $4 million a year. We, we created greater regulation on abortion clinics where, where there were horrific procedures. So I'm pro-life, uh, but I believe there should be exceptions. Rape, incest, and when the life of the mother is, uh, is in danger. And so that, that belief... And my consistency on this makes me, I think, poised to be in the right place, the sweet spot for a Republican nominee. And others may have a different view, and I respect it. But I think we have to be cognizant of the fact there's a lot of people that are concerned about uh, having a pro-life position without any exceptions. I do support an exception for the life of the mother because I'm pro-life. I just believe deeply that all human life is worthy of the protection of our laws. If I'm president and there's a bill that's passed that saves lives but it has exceptions, I'll sign it. But I do believe deeply that all human life is worthy of the protection of our laws. I've already said, for me, the issue of life is not a political issue. And I want to be frank. I would rather lose an election than be wrong on the issue of life. Governor 
Christie. You two have talked about Senator Rubio's position on the life issue. Some conservative activists have called this line of attack harmful to the pro-life cause. Well, I've been pretty helpful to the pro-life cause in one of the most pro-choice states in the union. I stood up for the first time and now for the last six years we've defunded Planned Parenthood, not talked about it like they do in Washington, D.C., but for six years as governor, Planned Parenthood does not receive that funding from the state budget anymore, over $50 million worth of money that's been saved now that is not going to do exactly what Hillary Clinton wants to have done as advocated for. She believes that that organization, which engages in the systematic murder of children in the womb, in order to maximize the value of their body parts for sale on the open market is an acceptable position. Let me tell you something. I don't care whether you're a millennial or whether you're in your 90s. No one, no one is for that type of activity unless you are the most radical type of extremist on this issue, like Senator Clinton and her party is on this issue. And I'll say one other thing. You know, the fact is that I believe that if a woman has been raped, that is a birth and a, and a pregnancy that she should be able to terminate. If she is the victim of incest, this is not a woman's choice. This is a woman being violated. And the fact is that we have always believed, as has Ronald Reagan, that we have self-defense for women who have been raped and impregnated because of it or the subject of incest and been impregnated for it. That woman should not have to deliver that child if they believe that violation is now an act of self-defense by terminating that pregnancy. Thank you all. Back to you, David and Martha. Mary Catherine, thank you. We're going to have closing statements here in just a moment, but before we go, a quick lightning round. Come November, two battleground states, but they face off tomorrow in the Super Bowl. Governor Kasich, who wins? I, of course. <laughs> Caroline is going to win that one. I hate to say it, but they're going to win that one. Governor Bush. Peyton Manning supporting me, and I'm for Denver. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Rubio. Well, I was going for Peyton Manning, but now I'm rooting for Carolina. <laughs> Paul Cam. Paul Cam. Mr. Trump. Carolina. With an eye to February 20th, Carolina. <laughs> All right, Dr. Parson. With 100% certainty, I will predict the winner. It will be either Denver or Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> Governor Christie, the last word. Denver. Denver. Thanks so much, gentlemen. Closing statements in just a moment. Right here is the ABC News Republican debate continues from New Hampshire right after this.